Kia ora everyone and welcome to another week of Vote 2023. My name is Sophie Woodham, this is Liam Connolly and today we're interviewing the Honourable Grant Robertson who is the former Deputy Prime Minister, Finance Minister, Dep Minister for Sport and Recreation, Cyclone Recovery, MP for Wellington Central and Leader of the House. We're privileged to be interviewing Grant today. How are you Grant? I'm good thank you, it's great to be with you. So we'd just like to start off with a quick fire round, so we just want one or two word answers for this one. <laughs> Perfect. So the first question is, could you provide us with three adjectives that describe the Labour Party? Uh, principled, uh, compassionate and balanced. Hmm. I just want to ask, who's your favourite member of Parliament? <laughs> oh, yeah, you've got to say the Prime Minister, don't you, um, <laughs> with, um, with Chris Hipkins. Um, yeah, um, Chippy would be right up there, uh, with that, um, but I've got a lot of love for my whole uh, Labour caucus. Uh, right now I'm spending a lot of time with Ibrahim Omar, who's um, our Wellington Central candidate and a List MP, so I'll put Ibrahim down for today. Awesome. I do just have to note that when we had James Shaw on the show, he did say you. So, uh, I also yeah. love James as well. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah, very good. Um, so another tricky question, if you were to join another political party, which would that be? Oh, look, I've never, I've never really thought about any party other than Labour. Um, I mean, obviously in Parliament, I'd say the party we're currently most aligned with is the Greens, obviously. Uh, but no, I've been a Labour man, it's the only political party I've ever been in. Hmm. What do you think the biggest issue uh, is that we face in Aotearoa today? Climate change, hmm. without a doubt. I mean, it's an existential challenge for the planet and how countries respond to it um, will make all the difference economically, socially and environmentally for generations to come. Mm. Do you think New Zealand should become a republic? I do. Uh, obviously, it's you know not the top of our priorities for some pretty obvious reasons with everything that's going on in the economy and in issues like climate change and child poverty and so on. So personally, I think it would be good if we had our own head of state uh, and I think that time will come. Uh, but right now, there's a few other things on our plate. Mm. Should cannabis be legalised? I voted for it. Uh, I voted yes in the referendum at the last election. Um, I don't see why uh, uh, people should be criminalised. I think the decriminalisation is the first step um, before that. Uh, it's an issue, you know, I mean, this is my sixth election that I'm running at, and it's an issue that's come up a lot, and I, you know, I do need to be straight up with people. It's never been my priority issue. Um, I think there are other things that are more important than it, but I did vote for, for the referendum because I don't believe we should make criminals of out of, of people who recreationally smoke cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, just in a few sentences, would you be able to tell us what you would like your political legacy to be? I always hate that question. I know this is meant to be quick fire because, of course, other people always write your political legacies. So I guess for me, I'll, I kind of look at it the other way around. I, I got into politics to advance the cause of social justice, to make New Zealand a fairer place and a place where everybody had a shot at achieving their potential, no matter what their background was. And, you know, I worked really hard to make that happen. And, you know, lots of things I can see over the last six years that I've been able particularly to do. So, you know, for me, it's about advancing the cause of social justice. Mm. Just building on that for the final quick fire question, I wanted to ask, who would you get to write your political legacy? Would it be your mum or one of your colleagues? I'd love, God, if my mum wrote it, um, it would be amazing. Um, <laughs> my mum's one of my big political influences and I try to talk to her every week and I usually get a, a fairly, fairly uh, decent um, chunk of views from her about what I should be doing mm. uh, as well as what I am doing. Mm. So I wouldn't mind mum writing it at all. Um, um, she would be a good person to write it. But you know, I think I'm finishing up as the MP for Wellington Central this time round. I'm only on the list. And I think some of the people I've worked for in Wellington Central are the ones who, you know, I look to because they're the people who ultimately put me in Parliament originally. And, you know, and, and you know, they've written some very kind things recently. And so, you know, perhaps, perhaps a little panel of those people would be good. Mm.
So I wanted to ask you, obviously you're a Dunedin boy, Otago boy, born and bred. Um, how do you think growing up in Dunedin has sort of shaped who you are today and the politics that you're sort of advocating for? Oh, just massively, I think. So I grew up in South Dunedin, Pretoria Avenue. Uh, it was where the family home was and I went to St Clair School and Macandra Intermediate and, and Kings High School. And I guess growing up in South Dunedin, it, it was a community not rich in money, but extraordinarily rich in community and, mm. and the values and the neighbourhood that we were in. And so I had a great upbringing, but it was also during the 1980s. And I watched lots of my friends' parents lose their jobs through the 80s and the then fourth Labour government and then into the 1990s and mm. I grew up in a Presbyterian church family and, and we, we talked a lot at home about fairness and bring your, being your brother and sister's keeper and, and looking after people and so I had that inculcated into me and then over time I did what most people who go to university in Dunedin do, I shifted to North Dunedin and I guess when I was there I confronted user pays and tertiary education the impact of that on the people I knew, there was no loan scheme around, you know, people just couldn't afford to be at university. And, and that opened my eyes and turned to other issues um, that were facing society. And so that time I spent as student president and, and living down there also influenced me. So yeah, Dunedin's, Dunedin's well and truly in my heart and it's in my political soul as well. Mm. Speaking about uh, your time in North Dunedin, we did talk to your old flatmate and Otago Law Professor Andrew Giddes. It's all lies. <laughs> and he <laughs> asked us, well he wants to ask you, how did someone who had trouble balancing their checkbook in university end up in charge of billion dollar budgets? A little oh, check there. so many things. How did a law professor, how did Andrew end up as a law professor after he <laughs> pushed out of orientation and got in trouble with the proctor? Um, look, yeah, no, um, uh, it, you know, Andrew and I were, were great, are great mates and lived together for three years flattered together so there's plenty of stories that go uh, both ways but one of the things about being finance minister is that yep you need to be able to look at numbers and talk about them but actually the biggest part of being finance minister is making decisions about what we invest in mm. there are decisions that are about not just the numbers they're about the impact on people and the environment so yeah being finance minister requires more than uh, those skills also loving that andrew's rolling out the idea of a checkbook did he have to explain to you what that actually was <laughs> no i think he just he wanted to get at you i think is all <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, so you mentioned a lot about tertiary education there, and I think that's an issue that's really close to home for a lot of students. So my first question for you is, just in 30 seconds, why should a tertiary student today vote for the Labour Party at this election? Yeah, so you know, we've got the record of having been the people who brought in first year uh, fees free, uh, Labour took interest off student loans, we've increased the amount of money you get through student allowance, allowances and the living cost component. But the one thing that stands out for me at this election is the half price public transport that we've brought in for under 25s that's at risk under a change of government. Absolutely. So all of those things um, are really interesting and important. But a really pressing concern is the major budget black holes that a lot of tertiary institutions are faced with. Otago is faced with a $60 million black hole. And although there's been some limited bailouts that go some ways to deal with the problem, um, it's currently not enough. And so we're seeing a whole lot of risk of job cuts, hundreds of people potentially losing their jobs, and um, some people questioning whether or not the integrity of these institutions could be at risk as a result of this. Um, so would you say that these bailouts go far enough? And if not, what is Labour going to do to fix these problems that are potentially going to plague these tertiary institutions for a long time? Yeah, and look, you know, in Budget 2023, we have put half a billion dollars in for tertiary institutions because we recognise the, the impact that the high rates of inflation were having. Uh, and then we top that up, as you're indicating, with about another 120 odd million dollars. Um, we've done that because we do want to make sure we keep our universities functioning well. But we also said at the same time when we put that additional funding in that we desperately need a review of tertiary funding in New Zealand. And I'm actually really pleased we've committed to that because at the root of this problem, in my view, is the funding model, the so-called bums on seats um, funding model, um, and also the competitive environment. Um, you know, there, it, in my view, in New Zealand, it is a pointless exercise, the universities spending so much money on marketing each other, against each other, when actually we need them to collaborate. And one of the things, and good things can come out of bad situations sometimes, uh, Otago and Victoria are now collaborating far more about the provision of some programs. So, you know, I am truly committed. I've worked in the tertiary sector. I did that time as a student politician. I'm truly committed to our tertiary sector. There are huge funding challenges. I've got some real questions about how 
institutions like Otago have ended up with that scale of debt relative to you know, where things are now. I know international student loss was a factor. There was some pretty ambitious budgeting around domestic enrolments that never happened. We've tried to help out to the extent we can balanced against all the other stuff that we've got to do in government. But I recognise it's tough for people, and that's why we're doing the funding review, is because we think we do need to take another look at how we do this to make sure there are truly strong uh, tertiary institutions out there. Mm. So during your time as OUSA president here at Otago, you and 12 other students were arrested after a protest against like, a hike in student fees. Um, we've had students here at Otago doing similar things. How else do we get our, our voices heard? I mean, you say you're going to do something about it, but what else can we do at this point? Yeah. Yeah, look, yesterday I was um, with uh, at Victoria University and some students were protesting there and, and came and talked to me about about their concerns about you know what we were doing and, and elsewhere. And, and I think that's really important. I think students should keep raising their voices about that. When that happened, we were facing, I think there was a 15% fee increase that mm. year and it had been an 18% fee increase the year before. And things were, you know, things were really, really spiralling um, out of control. Protesting's got to be part of it, but also working through organisations like NZUSA uh, to actually get you know information to the government that's important for students to do to talk at this election about the kinds of things you're looking for. So, you know that that role of protest and advocacy, I'm I'm still a huge fan of. Um, it's important, and governments do listen. You know, and we did hear loud and clear. Uh, when the original round of job cuts was proposed at places like Otago and Victoria, that we, you know, we didn't want to see that, and we, we and we went looking for what more money we could find. So, students have consistently advocated, you know, and that's why I'm a huge fan of student associations because you guys need a voice, and they are the voice, and it's appropriate that you challenge whoever's in government. Mm. Mm, absolutely. So, you say that you're going to do this review, and you say you've committed a whole lot of money to the tertiary sector in the latest budget, but these well, a large portion of these job cuts are still going ahead um, and it's still quite a painful process for these universities. Why has it not happened already? The review? Well, just like additional funding. Why, why was the yeah, bailout so, not so bigger? It, you know, at each budget, we've, we've put more money into the tertiary sector, but I recognise in some cases it hasn't been enough to keep up with the costs. We, we did make a really big move in this budget to put that extra money in. I mean, one of the things I had hoped was that um, some of the tertiary institutions would take a breath and see where that funding review ended up before they made some of the really big, significant decisions. There is a there is a kind of internal tension here, which is that tertiary institutions, and in particular universities, uh, their freedom is protected under the Education Act. And as a government, we don't make individual decisions about courses or programs. We do make the funding decision, I absolutely understand that. But the actual what happens in response to something we might do or say, we don't have that level of control. And so the councils you know, are protected in their right to make those decisions, that's as it should be. But some of the questions I think that are being asked, legitimately of us, also should be asked of the institutions themselves as to exactly how they got to where they got to, and also whether there are other ways of managing uh, some of the financial issues they've got. And then, as I say, getting ourselves to a more collaborative model that actually is going to be better for students and for the institutions. Mm. Um, just moving then to um, student allowances. Um, so we currently don't have universal student allowance, and it only covers a relatively small portion of students at the university. So are you currently happy with the way that student allowances operate and the criteria to qualify for them? And do you think it's something that needs to be expanded? Yeah, look, I mean, I think we would love to do that. We would love to see more students receiving allowances. It's a question of how we balance that with all the other priorities that we have as a government. And so we focused on lifting the amount uh, of the student allowance, and we've done that you know, consistently over the time we've been in government, and also the equivalent living cost component of the student loans. That was the priority we put in place, along with obviously the first year free. So it is a question of how you fit that with you know the demands we've got in housing and social development, apprenticeships, and so yeah, I would love to see more students accessing um, you know student allowances, but we just at this point in time haven't been able to go to that universality level. Um, but obviously that's an area that we'd like to keep working on. Mm. Yeah, I just want to hone in on that because like, currently two-thirds of students don't have enough money to meet their everyday needs and two-thirds of students are currently not being able to afford necessities. So I'm wondering, like 70% of students do undertake paid work, 
what else can we do? Like, yeah, look, it's tough, and I absolutely, you know, I hear those numbers, and I think yeah, that, that's a really difficult um, time for a lot of people. It is a combination of what we can do, and obviously we've got other forms of support beyond allowances, including in the accommodation area, which encourage people to, to make sure that they're, they're aware of what they're eligible for there. Obviously, there are other funds and supports, including hardship funds in existence that we've topped up um, over recent times as well. And then, as you say, you know, paid work. I mean, one of the things we have done is consistently lift the minimum wage mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we are allowing people, because many of the jobs students do tend to be down and around that minimum wage level to try and see that lift to help people's incomes lift and it's one of my concerns I have to say about a change of government is the very solid increases we've had to the minimum wage will stop mm. um, with a change of government so mm. not not backing away at all from the fact that it's hard for a lot of people mm. um, but a combination of all those things is what we've got in place. Mm. I just want to shift the conversation now to productivity. You talked about wages. So the NZ Productivity Commission says that workers in New Zealand work longer hours for less reward than workers in most other OECD countries. In short, New Zealand works harder rather than smarter. How do we reform our economy to work smarter and not harder? We know that hundreds of thousands of Kiwis are leaving over to Australia, to the UK. How do we keep them in New Zealand and pay them enough for the work that they are doing? Yeah, well, you've zeroed in on that because it's around. It's about the wages that people yeah. get. And in order to see wages lift, we have to be more productive. So being more, if there was one answer to this question, by the way, someone would have clicked their fingers and yeah. done it decades ago because it's such a long-running problem. So I'll just give you three or four. One, one of those is uh, the level of skills within New Zealand, and that comes not only from university education, it particularly comes from vocational education, and that's one of the reasons we put so much effort into that. So we need to lift our overall skill level. One of the kind of unsung things when you compare us to other countries who are more productive is our investment in research, science and innovation. And again, we've lifted that significantly through things like the R&D tax credit, we had about half a billion dollars in this budget for the new uh, multi-institution hubs that are going to bring private and public science together. So that investment in R&D, absolutely critical. And then another area where, again, demonstrably we're way behind other countries is our infrastructure. And that's because of a failure to invest over decades in New Zealand. So we've really upped our game in that, and we've got about $77 billion coming in over the next five years to improve the quality of, of the infrastructure we, we publicly provide. So there are a couple of the areas. It's not that sexy because there isn't this one thing. And the other thing is making, I guess if I had one more, in, it's making the investments alongside businesses in the jobs that will create higher wages and are also lower emissions as mm. well. And so that's why you've seen us do things like the rebate for the game development sector. Uh, the support for the digital economy, for the, for the space sector, mm. areas where we know New Zealand's doing well and we think we can really lift our um, game in and create those high paying jobs. I remember a few years back going to a talk uh, that a guy named Sean Hendy did and he put up a graphic of New Zealand and Denmark's economies from the 1960s and then into the 90s and into the 2000s. And Denmark was mainly an agricultural economy like New Zealand was in those early decades. But then it added some of these digital and technological things on top and it began to outstrip us significantly. We're good at agriculture, we should keep doing it, but we should find ways of adding value, reducing emissions and investing in these new economy industries. So a combination of all of that, it's a big challenge. I have to say some of our plans of getting on with this got disrupted by COVID, but this budget, that was our big push, was higher wage jobs in a low emissions economy. Cool. So could I just switch tack here um, and talk about some party politics? So current polling suggests that Labour is likely to lose a great deal of the list seats that they've currently had um, in this most recent government. Um, and so that's going to mean that a whole lot of people are going to be leaving Parliament. So firstly, what has been your experience with so many Labour MPs in government? And secondly, um, there are some commentators that suggest that um, this reduction will mean that there's, um, depending on how local electorates play out, going to be a lot of people who are quite high up on the list who aren't going to make it into Parliament. So how do you see that playing out? Yeah, in terms of your first question, it's been just the most brilliant experience with this caucus of people. I remember the first day that the new intake of MPs came in, 
And there was a couple of them I'd only, one I'd met once and one I'd never met because we did win some seats we weren't expecting to. And I remember as they introduced themselves, the number of PhDs in the room, the number of, and we had a couple of GPs in the room, you know, it was, it was extraordinary. And, And over this period, I've just come to admire them all so much. And so, yeah, look, you know, on current polling, a number of those people won't be there. And that's, that's incredibly sad. They've all made a great contribution. And I, I hope for ones who perhaps don't get back, that they think about coming back again in the future, because they've, they've pretty much universally uh, been a terrific group. In terms of the second part of your question, yeah, look, you know, ultimately, the more votes Labor gets, the more MPs we get. And whether how that splits between uh, electorates and list MPs is one of those things that you, you find out on the night. Um, I just want to make sure that people understand, and I'm sure most of the people watching this do, that it is your party vote that determines the makeup of the government and the makeup of Parliament. And so obviously I want people to cast their party vote for Labour and then we'll get more Labour MPs. But I'll be disappointed for any of my colleagues who put themselves back up again and haven't got back because they've all contributed really well. Mm. Now, Grant, you also currently hold the role of Minister for Cyclone Recovery. Uh, We know that the climate and degradation of our planet is one of the biggest issues facing everyone in New Zealand and globally. Um, Do you think New Zealand is acting as quickly as we need to in terms of the pace of change and adaptation? Yeah, I mean, big question. Um, If if I answer it in the two parts of emissions reduction and adaptation. Mm -hmm. On emissions reduction, we've made some really good progress in the last three years. Um, We've got those emission reduction plans in place. Um, We've been supporting that through the dedicated climate emergency response fund. Square brackets going to be taken away by national. You know, that's the fund that's helping us reduce our emissions through industrial heat, through the transport fleet, things like the clean car discount. So we're making really good progress. Absolutely get the desire to move quicker. One of the things I've certainly learned about politics over a long time is you've got to bring people with you, and I think we've been doing a good job of that, and the pace has to ramp up. But the good news is we have a plan. It's very clear about the reductions we've got to make, and that's why you'll keep seeing us moving in that direction. On the second part of your question around adaptation, I think what the recent cyclone events have shown us is actually that New Zealand is not prepared the way we need to be. These intense and regular climate-induced weather events are going to happen every year in New Zealand now. And one of the things when we had the cyclone um, this time round was that I was quite frustrated by the fact that all of our responses were quite ad hoc. You know, we were just trying to make sure we got stuff to the communities. And so we've been working through our national adaptation plan. We've got a piece of legislation that James Shaw's been working on. It's, you know, ready to go through Parliament um, around a National Adaptation Act. And then I, in this budget, created something called the National Resilience Plan, specifically to get ahead of where uh, our adaptation challenges are. Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens, we've ended up having to spend most of that money in the first instance on the cyclone-affected regions just to get them back going again. But I'd rather we were ahead of the game on that. And one of the questions that's been asked to me a few times in the campaign is, how do we do that? And there's a big conversation coming up for the next government around what the long-term plan is. You know, if there's an earthquake in New Zealand, we've got an organisation called EQC, and people pay levies into that uh, to make sure that there's enough money in what's called the National Disaster Fund to be able to pay out to people in an earthquake. We don't have the equivalent of that for climate change. So, Grant, just to jump in. So one of the questions I'm asking people is, how do we make that work into the future? Mm. Um, So on that, you talk a lot about how we need to be resilient and build up these plans. So why was there a cut of $236 million to the Climate Emergency Response Fund? Yeah, so what happened there was when we came to the budget in 2023, uh, so the Climate Emergency Response Fund is the recycling of the emissions trading scheme revenue. When we came to the budget in 2023, we hadn't got as much money from the emissions trading scheme as we expected. So we we topped up the Climate Emergency Response Fund from uh, from the general taxation by about a billion dollars or slightly more than that. When it came time to do some of the savings we've done, we took that 236 million out. Now that's 236 million out of a multi-billion dollar fund, but it was because we'd topped it up from general taxation and we were doing savings across the board. When you look at it in the round, we put billions of dollars in. There was a small amount taken off the extra bit that we'd put in. The good news is now that the carbon price is slightly higher and the amount of money that's going to come back into uh, the Climate Emergency Response Fund will be higher. 
But I know, you know, I want to make the political point again, uh, National are using that fund to pay for their tax cuts rather than investing it in climate action. Yeah, so now we'll just move on to tax and inequality, which I think was a large issue that the government is facing. So a recent IRD report revealed that the richest Kiwis are paying an effective tax rate of just 9.5%, while median earners are ta being taxed at a rate of 22% on their income and an effective tax rate that's closer to 30% with the GST that they pay on the goods and services that they buy. Um, so this in large part really skews the tax system. So we want to know why because Labour has been in government for the past three, um, six years and has had um, a majority for the past three years, why nothing has been done to address this massive in inequity in our tax system? Yeah, so I'd argue that's not quite right um, because we've, we've taken you know, actions like lifting the top um, income tax rate and most recently putting the trustee rate up to that uh, top rate of 39 cents as well. And that is going to drive um, down inequality in particular because a lot of people have used trusts to shelter some of their income and so that will have an impact on that. In terms of the first three years we're in government, we were in coalition and we simply weren't in a position to be able uh, to make those changes. In the second term of government, David Parker led the work that you're quoting from. That comes from work that he uh, got IRD to do. And that work will be you know, testing for future governments to work out how to make the tax system work better. The decision we made for this election is that we're living in you know, some of the most volatile and uncertain economic times of my lifetime. And upending the tax system at the moment is not the answer for New Zealanders. We need stability. I mentioned the word balance before. Uh, and that's the priority at this point in time, you know. And we've got a tax system in New Zealand that by and large is delivered for us, but there are clearly issues that still need to be resolved within it. But we have to make sure we look after New Zealanders in this particular period of time. And it's our view that the stability in the tax system is right for the, for the time that we're in. So you talk about stability. But we've seen that through these very unstable times like COVID and this type of thing, um, the impacts have been really disproportionately harmful to our poorest people in New Zealand. And at the same time, um, wealthy people have been minimally harmed, if anything at all. Some have even profited out of this globally, especially. So how does that really represent stability when we could be taxing the wealthiest people more in order to redistribute those effects and mean that our poorest people aren't being so negatively impacted? Look, and the reason why we put so much money over the course of the last few years into supporting our lowest income New Zealanders for exactly the reason that you say. You know, we've lifted benefits every single year. We've got them back up to the rate that the equivalent rate of where they were when they were slashed about 30 odd years ago. We've lifted family tax credit, child care assistance, all in the minimum wage, all of those things, because we do recognise how the impact can disproportionately fall on those on the lowest incomes. You know, it's, it's a mixed bag at the other end of the spectrum. You know, I hear numbers tossed around about how businesses have benefited. You need to pull that apart a little bit, particularly small businesses, which make up about three quarters of New Zealand businesses. It's been a real struggle over the last few years. And again, we've provided a lot of support there. So I understand um, the point that you're making and that, you know, that there are inequalities and equities in our society, which we have to keep addressing. Uh, but I think we've done a pretty good job over the last few years of supporting our lowest income New Zealanders. I just want to jump straight to housing. We know that there's still a major housing problem in New Zealand. We know that the government has prioritised public debt reduction and reduced public infrastructure spending. House price inflation has been the most extreme in the developed world over the last 20 years because our infrastructure deficit is bigger than most of the other OECD countries and we have not had a capital gains tax. How do we fix the housing crisis? Yeah, and look, you know, most of what you've said there, I'd certainly agree with. What I'd probably disagree with, though, is we most definitely have not cut infrastructure spending. In fact, we've significantly increased it. But we are coming back, as you point out, from a decades-long underinvestment in infrastructure. So the way we get out of this is we build more houses. And from the government's end, we've built more state houses, public houses, uh, since any government since the 1950s. And had the previous national government built houses at the same rate we're building them now, much of the state house waiting list would disappear. So that's the core business of government. We've got on with that. We've also supported and facilitated the building of more affordable housing and created new ways of people buying homes with first home lending and uh, grants, sorry, and also the progressive home ownership scheme. I think we do need to keep investing in those schemes and more of them. 
Um, we've got more consents available um, than we've had before. We've put in place what's called the medium density uh, housing rules. Unfortunately, National's backed away from those that were designed to get councils to allocate you know, more housing and allow cities to go up rather than out. So we're doing all of those things, but it is a very long-winded challenge, and it is also interrelated. So this is one of my big fears, I have to tell you, about a change of government, is the National Party will go back to their mantra of the 1990s and the last government of just saying the market's going to sort this out. It hasn't. We've come in and we've invested significantly in this area, but in the current plans of the National Party, no public housing will be built after 2025. And, and I've been around too long to trust National's word on that one. So I'm proud of our record, more to do, uh, but, but the secret here is building houses. Um, so in the limited time we have left, I really just wanted to ask you about your GST-free food and fruit and veg policy. Um, so it's been widely criticised by a great deal of economists for in fact being a bit regressive. It'll save um, wealthier households who buy more fresh produce more. And it also has a lot of like immense administrative costs. So what is your response to that? Well, on the latter point, um, we've only, you know, we've got the supermarket duopoly in New Zealand and we are working to, to see better competition in that sector. But at the moment, one half of that is an Australian outfit, Progressives, Woolworths. They already do this in Australia. So there's no great administrative burden on them to do this. And I'm absolutely certain that foodstuffs uh, will be able to cope with it as well. So I, th I tend to think that that's a bit of a red herring. Uh, in terms of the value of the policy, you do need to see it in the context of our broader uh, 10 point cost of living plan. One of the things that gets raised with me the most is the cost of food. And this is a contribution, it's a small one, I get that, but a contribution we can make to reducing the cost of food. And again, on, on that point about who it might benefit or not, you know, I know a lot of people in the communities and around the areas where I live and more broadly, who, who've, you know, who walk through the veggie aisle and don't buy anything. We want to make sure we've made a contribution to that. And I think the other point is the inclusion of frozen fruit and vegetables means that a wider group of people, I think, will, will be um, accessing this. Mm. Um, just further on there, um, so Chris Hipkins has recently abandoned or has said that Labor is not going to pursue a wealth tax at all. And we know that that's something that you were initially an advocate for and you saw merit in. Um, does it sit right with you that that's been abandoned? Do you think that would be a better way to deal with those cost of living crises? And do you think that you're more likely to vote for the Greens or someone else who advocates for it, considering your own political thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I mean, we, we did the work on it because we were looking at all of the options that were available to us. But we made a decision that we weren't going to go ahead with the wealth tax because at the moment in the economy that we're in, it's not the right policy um, for the volatile and uncertain times we're in. And because there are also issues with it, not many people have implemented it. And, it, you know, there is a lot of potential fish hooks in a policy like that. So, no, I'm backing the balanced policy that we've got. Um, I do think it will contribute to reducing the cost of living. And I do think it contributes to the reduction of inequality. Mm. Just one final quick question before we wrap up. You were OUSA president um, back in your day. Our current 30 OUSA years ago this year. 30 years ago, yeah. That's how old I am. <laughs> Our current OUSA president has been campaigning really hard to have students included in the winter energy payment scheme. Can you give me a 10 second answer as to why they aren't included? Yeah, look, when we, when we did this, we, we targeted low income people and superannuitants. There were there was issues around at that point, particularly for older people in terms of heating their homes. It's another one of those things that would be really nice to do. And again, I encourage the campaign because I can understand where you're coming from. We've just got to balance up the budget that we've got and the resources we have. But, it, you know, I, it, it certainly students are another group of generally low income people for whom I know it would be beneficial. We've just got to balance it against all the other needs we've got. It's been a pleasure ha having you on the show today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Grant, and also thank you to our dedicated production team and, of course, our viewers. We'll be back with more thought-provoking discussion soon. Until then, stay informed, stay engaged, and thanks for tuning in.